Welcome back to my channel. Today we have a treat for you. I'm here with Dr. Rachel Rubin. She is a urologist and fellowship trained expert in female and male sexual dysfunction. So I'm so happy to have her here today. Glad to be here. So we are going to react to last week's tonight episode of John Oliver, where he talks about bias in medicine. So let's get started. Doctors, rated number one by Reasons There's a Finger in Your Ass magazine. I always tell patients my finger is just as smart as my male colleagues, but much skinnier. But while medicine may be the most respected of all professions, it is important to know that not everyone has the same experience when they visit a doctor. I think I would have been treated completely differently if I had been male. You'll hear doctors and nurses like, oh, they're just exaggerating, Dramatic. you know, and not really listening to them because it's a black person. But if it's like a white person, um, it's just like, oh my God, like this is serious. It's true. If you are a woman and or a person of color in the US, you may well have a very different relationship to our healthcare system than a white man. I see a lot of patients who are African-American, Hispanic, all sorts of nationalities and races. And I think that they definitely have a, a different experience. And I know you see a lot of women in your practice. I'm actually thinking of doing a coffee table book that is titled Dumb Shit Doctors Say to Women. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Get Your Latest Copy. It's rampant. It is people say some really stupid things to women who complain of pain and sexual dysfunction. Women's bodies have always been fraught with judgment and misconceptions. Mom, can I go swimming with Peggy tomorrow after school? No, it's not a good idea the first two or three days of your period. You might get chilled and catch cold. Oh, that's right. Peggy, of course I can't go swimming. You know I've got the curse. That was only 1953, so that wasn't that long ago that this is what people see in movies and television. My mother was born in 1953. So how do we teach our daughters about how to view their bodies? It starts from birth and it's how their mothers taught them and how you're raised. It's very deep. Yeah, didn't you guys know we're cursed? I mean, we basically walk around with a hat on our head with a big scarlet M once a month. and it... Never trust anything <laughs> that bleeds for five days and doesn't die. <laughs> Things have clearly improved since then, but women can still face an uphill battle to get quality health care. There are many, many studies showing this. For instance, they found that women were less likely to be referred for knee replacements than men. If they're over 50 and critically ill, they were less likely to receive life-saving interventions. And when going to the ER with urgent abdominal pain, women were less likely to receive any pain medicine. Just listen to one doctor sum up how too many in her profession treat female patients. I think that a lot of times women's symptoms, especially pain, are attributed to emotional imbalance or, you know, women being hysterical or crying wolf about their pain, and, and that's absolutely wrong. Hysteria is alive and well in this country, and not just our country, but around the world. If you've got pelvic pain, you get lumped into this category of whiny woman disease. It takes patients 10, 20 doctors before eventually they get to me and they realize that all of the pain in their vulva, the pain in their pelvic pelvic floor, the pain in their vagina, it's all from their back pain or from their tight muscles from their back problems and nobody believes them and um, it's pretty crazy. I see so many women all the time and I ask everyone if they have pain with sex and they look at me like they can't believe I'm even asking them because they haven't been asked and it's, it's really a shame because these women are, you know, struggling or suffering and they have no one to talk to. They can't even tell their doctors about it heart attacks. You're conditioned to think of them uh, looking like they do on TV all the time. You know, people grabbing their chest and then falling over. But for many women, that is not what they look like. Instead, their heart attacks present with subtler symptoms like pain in the back or jaw, nausea, and unusual fatigue. And lots of doctors miss that. Just look what happened to Catherine Leon, who went to the ER with serious heart problems and was told this. The young doctor came in, very condescending, thought I was just a drama queen. And he said, it's not my job to tell you what's wrong with you. It's my job to tell you what it's not, and it's not your heart. And that was it. I was like, well, what do I do next? And he's like, you go home. We actually see a diagnosis in women, too, in urology, 
For example, bladder cancer diagnosis for women is delayed it's because very often they present with blood in the urine, which usually prompts a workup, but a lot of women are misdiagnosed with urinary tract infections. They are then delayed to get the appropriate workup, and subsequently, when they are diagnosed, they're diagnosed at a later stage and then have worse outcomes. There is a huge disparity in life expectancy between black and white Americans, particularly for black men. In fact, when one study tried to quantify what is called the mortality gap, they found some shocking numbers, which this documentary chose to illustrate in the most jarring possible way. We found over 83,000 excess deaths per year in the African-American community alone. Clearly, there are systemic factors contributing to that number, but even just when it comes to contact with the healthcare system, there can be appalling disparities. There are, again, many studies showing African-Americans have a lower likelihood of receiving recommended care for everything from pneumonia uh, to hip fractures to multiple cancers. The prostate cancer thing is very well known in urologic literature. Essentially, black men are more likely to be diagnosed or die of prostate cancer when compared to a white man. And that can be for a number of reasons. Prostate cancer is genetically different in black men. There's also some different risk factors like diet, lifestyle, that may contribute to having higher risk of prostate cancer. And then ultimately, access to care can be different because of different socioeconomic factors. We also know treatment for prostate cancer is going to affect people's quality of life. I see men and women for sexual dysfunction and prostate cancer treatments, all of them have effects on quality of life, whether it's sexual dysfunction or urinary incontinence or urinary frequency and urgency. And we're, you know, we often don't focus on um, explaining those side effects to people if we have only 10 minutes with them and there's a bias in how we talk to people or what we think if a person is over the age of 70, don't ask them if they're sexually active, you don't ask them if they're gay and have anal sex, right? Until this year, we didn't have guidelines for gay men and prostate cancer. Talk about a bias in medicine. It took till this year to have guidelines for if someone has anal sex, how soon can they have sex after a prostate biopsy? What are the rules after a prostatectomy? What are the rules after radiation? We don't have those conversations because nobody likes to talk about sex or ask people what kind of sex they're having. Absolutely. So we'll link to those guidelines below in case anybody wants to because see Because of that. racism, black people, we don't even get our hands on opioids. <laughs> White people get opioids like they Tic Tacs. <laughs> it amazes me how many opioids you motherfuckers have. <laughs> I had a double mastectomy. You know what they sent my black ass home with? I boo fuck profen. It just shocks me again how pain management is so uh, mismanaged in this country. I get the opioid crisis is real, it's important, it needs to be talked about, but how about the fact now that gabapentin is going on the, you know, naughty list of things that you can't prescribe or you're going to be dinged every time you prescribe? How about the idea of getting people in to see pain management doctors? They get put in this box of crazy people if you have pain. Everyone has pain, back pain. I had a kidney stone myself two weeks ago. Pain is real, okay? Yeah. That Opioids have their role. Um, right. It's really amazing how um, we don't do a good job talking about pain management and really working with people who have different levels of pain. So actually, there is some data that black people who use opioids long term when compared to their white counterparts are more likely to get tested for illicit drugs in their urine and also are more likely to have their opioids stop for pain control. So there definitely is a disparity. And some of this is because of obviously implicit or explicit bias in, in providers, but there's also the way that media portrays pain control when there are crime stories or news investigations with um, Caucasian people they're often giving you a whole narrative as to why they use the drugs or giving you a story that you can relate to and think that it's not really inherently a problem with their morality whereas when it's a person of color they're often talking about the, just their, their name the offense and uh, what the drug was and that's it they're not really going into detail about it yeah what about I mean physical therapy we talked to we see a ton of patients with pelvic pain and back pain 
But physical therapy isn't an automatic thing. A lot of insurance companies won't cover physical therapists mm -hmm. or out-of-network physical therapists for the specialists who focus on pelvic health. So you have this problem where only rich people can afford to get the physical therapy that they need and the pain management that they need, those things that are actually help their pain. And studies recently showed we only have 10 minutes with people, right? If you do 10-minute office visits, the later the doctor is in their schedule, the more opioids they have. Oh, I didn't see that one. We'll, we'll link that one down below too. I actually want to tell you guys a story. So I had a patient the other day who was waiting for me and I was talking to um, this other patient and her daughter or niece was sitting in the, in the hallway and I walk out and she's talking to my other patient and like outside their room and I asked my nurse, I'm like, are they friends? And she's like, no, Dr. Malik, they're not friends. She's like, that woman just paid her to give a urine sample on her behalf. Literally, she's like, don't test her urine. That is that other woman's urine because she was scared. She was scared that we we're going to drug test her. And I was like, this is a urologist's office. We don't do that. But, you know, from her perspective, I mean, she's scared of being labeled in, in a certain way. And that's, that's really sad. And, and back to your point on physical therapy, it also is very time consuming to go to physical therapy. And to be honest, a lot of people, people who have uh, lo lower socioeconomic status cannot afford to take a day off of work once a week for eight to 12 weeks. That's a huge time commitment. And the danger is if you consistently have bad experiences with healthcare, you might be less inclined to seek help that you need in the future. Just listen to this woman who was diagnosed with lupus describe how she was impacted by the response from doctors when she sought pain treatment. There was just this belief that I was making things up, that what I was saying wasn't real, that I must be seeking drugs or selling the drugs or some such thing. Is that really what people would, that's, that's what you were getting? In the oh yeah, office. absolutely, absolutely. And so what happens is you start to develop a, a ton of fear around going to the doctor come in as a patient and you have all these issues and all these things you want to talk about, but the doctor doesn't have the time to attend to all those things. So you feel brushed off, you feel rushed. And, and then of course, you're not going to want to go back or have or feel nervous about going again because you feel vulnerable and you feel scared. We're going to miss things. If you only have 10 minutes with a patient, something's going to get missed. The way, you know, insurance reimbursement works and the way the current healthcare system works and getting so many people in so quickly. It's so frustrating for doctors. Of course, it's frustrating for patients. They don't yeah. want to pay their co-pays and their huge out-of-network deductibles to get mm -hmm. a 10-minute visit where you're not going to tell them anything that they don't already know. And right. so it's just easier to not come to the doctor. Patients are having to choose. Do I want to go to the ER with my sick kid? I know they're going to just tell me, you know, it's viral. Um, do I want to pay all that money? People have biases and doctors are people. And they may have come up in a system that intentionally or not has often discounted the experiences of a major portion of the population. And their biases, explicit or implicit, have life or death consequences. Doctors are people. As female urologists, we're unicorns. We're not real people. No, we're not. It's important to know that there are biases in medicine. Absolutely, there's biases everywhere, right? Whether they're explicit, being they're there, you can obviously notice that they're having a bias, or they're implicit or unconscious, which happens a lot of the time because people have different life experiences, right? People from different walks of life, and so they carry those biases with them. But I think there's a lot of factors here that are in play that you know, John Oliver doesn't really get into that affect the way people are taken care of. And one that we've talked about a lot today is how little time we have. I think most people are genuinely trying to do the best they can. People are not malicious or have bad intent in taking care of patients. I think we can definitely do a better job. As soon as we stop trying to be better, what's the point? I mean, right. we always have to try to be better, learn more in medicine, do mm -hmm. more research, help more people. Yeah. Um, the system is broken uh, in so many ways and we have to keep when things aren't right, stand up and speak out. And it's, it's complicated, it's hard sometimes. Perhaps no starker expression of where sex and race can negatively impact healthcare outcomes than maternal mortality. Currently, the United States has the highest rate of maternal mortality in the developed world, which is already terrible, but it gets even worse for black women. If you're a woman of color in this country, especially if you're black, your odds of dying in childbirth are three to four times higher on average in our country. Why? Because you're not talking about access to health care. You're not talking about money or education. No, and this is going to be hard to hear. We believe black women less when they express concerns about the symptoms they're having, particularly around pain. Serena Williams almost died giving birth. If Serena Williams, one of the richest people in the United States, 
almost dies, we are doing something wrong. It's an implicit bias, This, these ideas that we're not choosing to, to treat people differently, but it's happening. The data shows it. But how do we care about women? How do we talk to women? We were talking about physical therapy earlier. Again, if you have a knee replacement, you automatically go to physical therapy twice a week. Hip replacement, same thing. If a bowling ball comes out of your vagina or out of your stomach, you have to beg uh, to understand why you have pain. I just saw a woman this week, two years, she has had horrible pain and nobody has even said the word physical therapy to her two years after her kid. It, it shouldn't take that long to get women heard. Women need to be listened. I'm so, so glad that you're here. I bet you are. Yeah. <laughs> it's just because I, I was a bit worried that I might be a bit too white to give advice on this subject. Well, well that's because you are. Oh, I mean, right. You're, you're real white. I am, yeah. yeah. I, I bet you clap on the one and the three, don't you? <laughs> I honestly wouldn't know how else to do it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you just gonna have me stand here? Oh, would you rather? Uh, yeah, I would. Oh, I okay. Mean, sure, sure, please. You get to sit. Let yeah, me okay. sit. All right. Should I? Better. Should I? Should I just crouch? Should I? You, you, you can oh, go. I can go. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Look, if you're a woman or a person of color, going to the doctor can be rough. Been there, done that, got the ibuprofen. <laughs> but there's some things we can do. First, doctors and med students should get bias training. I know that doesn't sound like fun but it's one of those things that's not fun, but you should do it anyway. Second, we need more diversity in the medical field. We need more non-white doctors in actual hospitals, not just the ones made up by Shonda Rhimes. <laughs> and finally, until we do those first two things, you've got to advocate for yourself. And if that doesn't work, don't worry, I've got a backup plan. It's called, bring a white man. <laughs> She brings up some great points. I think uh, one implicit bias training, so I've actually had that in my institution, and I think it's helpful. It does go through, it does kind of help you uncover some of your implicit biases. There's also a tool online uh, that can help you look at your implicit biases. So if you're curious, I'll put it um, in the link below so you can try and take the quiz and see what comes up. I think that's extremely valuable because they're implicit for a reason. They're unconscious and people don't know they have them. So including wow. minorities in medicine or diversifying medicine is extremely, extremely important. So in urology, there are about 9% of women who are practicing in urology, but in training, there's almost 26% right now. So, you know, it's, it's definitely increasing. And the percentage of minorities, there's about 2% African Americans and about 4% Hispanic population in urology, but we definitely could use more. And then lastly, advocating yourself is very important, but it's actually really hard to do. So I know she jokes about bringing a white man, with, but you can bring anybody with you, your family, your friends, um, your neighbor, just someone who's another set of ears to hear what you have to say or what the doctor's saying. It can help ask questions that maybe you don't think of, maybe take notes so you can remember. Uh, you have to ask questions. You have to speak up. If something's not right and you're not being heard, find people who will listen, who will take the time and work with you and know that this is not in your head. And even if it is in your head, your head's a part of your body and it needs to be addressed. And so you, the whole you needs to be taken care of. Absolutely. And, and get a second opinion. If you're not happy with your doctor or what they said, there is never harm in getting another opinion because it's important to make sure you feel comfortable with whoever is treating you, whether it's for pain. A good doctor will always support you getting a second opinion. Mm -hmm. And if they give you a hard time for reaching out to someone else, then you did a smart thing by going to get that second opinion anyway. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rubin, for joining us today. And I hope you guys enjoyed our episode of Reacting to John Oliver. Please make sure to comment below. Let us know what you thought. If there's anything else you want us to discuss, or if you'd like to see Dr. Rubin again talking about sexual dysfunction issues, she let me know. A lot to say. Yeah, <laughs> let me know because we'll, we'll arrange to do this again. Thank you. And always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.